In this video, we're going to talk about importing data into R, which we've done many times before, but this time we're actually going to take a deeper look at how we do it and what are the various types of data we can import and what we should be paying attention to when we import data into R. Let's start with rectangular data. There are two packages that we're going to use for reading rectangular data into R, a ReadR, which comes with a tidyverse, and ReadExcel, which is a tidyverse-friendly package that allows you to read data files directly from an Excel file. Um, ReadR comes with a list of functions that basically indicate what type of file you're reading it from. So for example, read underscore CSV, which we've seen many times so far, is for comma delimited files. There's a version of that called read underscore CSV2 for semicolon separated files, so on and so forth for tab, any delimiter, or fixed width files. Um, and in read Excel, we're going to be using the function read underscore Excel that can read any type of Excel file with the extension XLS or XLSX. When we're reading data into R, uh, let's start with this uh, CSV example. So read underscore CSV is the function we use. The argument, the first argument for that function is called file. And oftentimes you'll see me omit this first argument when we write code. And then we give it the full file path of where we can find this file. So uh, we want to use uh, we want to use something like an organizational structure where it's very clear where we are placing our files in our projects. So we'll call that uh, folder data. So that's what this first bit of the file path indicates. And then the name of the file we're reading is nobel.csv. So that's why we're using the read underscore CSV function. And we're saving this as an object called nobel in R. There's no requirement that the name of the object in R must match the name of the data file. And oftentimes, they're probably going to be different by a little bit. But um, it will help you keep things straight if you try to match them as much as possible. The result of reading a data file using read underscore CSV is an object called a tibble, which uh, the best way to discuss that is probably saying that um, it's the interpretation of data frames in the tidyverse. And it nicely prints out the number of rows and the columns for you. And it also doesn't try to just kind of print out the entire data set, which would be overwhelming, but prints whatever fits on your screen and the rest of them are summarized by saying we have 929 more rows than the six they have shown us here and 19 more variables. Uh, we can also write data files. So in order to exemplify that, I'm going to create a uh, data frame first and then write it out. So we're going to create a data frame using the triple function, which is just a take on tibble. And what that allows me to do is to create a, a data frame by typing it out row by row, which as you can imagine would get extremely tedious if what we are doing is writing it like a, um, a meaningful large data set. But here I'm just making a small example. So this is often useful. This function is often useful for making small code examples for debugging or for sharing with others. So I'm creating a data frame called DF that has two columns, X and Y. X has the values one through three, and Y has the values A, B, and C as a character strings. And once I have this data file, a data frame created in R, I can write it out using the write underscore CSV function. The first argument of that is the data frame that we're writing out, just like any other uh, tidyverse functions. And the second argument is where we want to place that data frame. So I'm saying that take that and create a file called df.csv and place that in the folder called data. We can then read it back in from that same location and inspect to make sure that it looks exactly as we intended it to. So at this point, I'd recommend that you pause the video and go to RStudio Cloud and do a little bit of an exercise in reading in uh, files and writing out files. So this is the uh, sixth application exercise called Nobels and Sales and Data Import. Uh, open the file called Nobels-CSV, uh, the R Markdown file, and knit it to make sure everything is working before you start working on it. What we're asking you to do is to read in this Nobels file that I just showed you. It is currently stored in a folder called data-raw. 
Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to split this into two. So some of these Nobel awards are for STEM fields and some of them are for non-STEM fields. And for the purposes of this exercise, we're defining STEM fields as physics, medicine, chemistry, and economics. You're loading in the data, then we want you to split it into two. So you can think about how you can do that with using the filter function for um, fields uh, that are in physics, medicine, chemistry, or economics. Save that as an object called Nobel underscore STEM. The other one is another data frame called Nobel underscore non-STEM that filters for the remaining uh, fields. And then we want to write both of these out. And when you write them out, you want to give them meaningful names. Um, again, it doesn't necessarily have to match the object's name, but it's nice if it does. It makes your life easier. And we want to save them into a folder called data. And you can see that I'm making a distinction between data raw and data here. And that's also common practice. When you get some data that you want to analyze, you probably want to place that into a folder called data raw saying, I'm going to read this data into R, but I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to save over it so that I can always go back to the data I started with. Then you do whatever manipulation you want to do in R. And then if you want to save the result of an interim file that you're going to then be analyzing, you can save that into a folder called data. Those two folders are already created for you on RStudio Cloud as well. So you're reading in from one, you are splitting the data into two and you're writing to the other. And a hint, you might want to use the in operator that we've learned about last week when filtering the data frame for particular um, STEM fields. You don't have to use this operator, but it will make your life easier and make your code a little bit easier to read if you do. Next, let's talk about variable names. It's very common that you get a data set where the names of the variables are not actually um, Next, let's talk about variable names. So it's very common that you get a data file where the names of the variables are not very user friendly or maybe coder friendly. So here I have a data set called uh, adbnb, which is the Edinburgh Airbnb data set that we've looked at earlier, but I've modified the data set a little bit and I've called it adbnb bad names. And you can see that when I read this data frame into R and then I look to see what are the column names using the names function, some of them are in capital letters, some of them have spaces in the variable names, some of them follow the snake case convention that we've been using. Um, and others use a variety of other structures. So um, while R is perfectly happy handling uh, variable names like this, oftentimes you're going to run into issues if you want to use the variable name as is. For example, here, if I wanted to plot the number of bathrooms uh, and the price of these uh, from this data frame, and I type number of bathrooms the same way it appears in the um, data frame, it's not going to work for me uh, because uh, R doesn't actually allow these spaces in variable names. So I'd have to quote that variable name so that it knows that that is a uh, character string to look for in the headers of your data. That's going to be quite error prone and a little bit tedious to work with. So usually when you get a data frame that has these bad names, you probably want to clean them out. And there are a variety of ways you can do this, but I'm going to show you two ways. One of them is to actually define the column names as you're reading them in. Now, obviously, before you read in your data, you have no idea what those variable names are going to be. So what you might want to do is read it in the same way we did before, take a note of what they were, and then decide what you actually want to call them. Sometimes the variable names uh, as they're given to you might be very long, but you might come up with something a lot shorter. So um, for example, here we had number of bathrooms as one of the variable names. But what I have done is I've just said, I think if I label it simply bathroom, I'll know what it's talking about. I don't need this long phrase for a variable name. So you, you can do this within the read underscore CSV function using the call names argument. So here you want to give it a vector that basically has the variable names that you want to assign. You need to make sure that what you're giving it is the exact same number as the variables there are in your data set. 
And then when you read this in and take a look at the names, you can see that you're actually ending up with exactly what you intended. So this is one option. Another option is using a, another package called Janitor. This is not a Tidyverse package necessarily, but it's a Tidyverse friendly package. It works nicely with uh, other Tidyverse functions and especially within a pipeline. And it happens to have this function called clean names that I really like that takes variable names and using some heuristic basically turns them into snake case. So it's not going to simplify them for you. If you have something really long as a variable name, it'll simply make everything lowercase and replace any of the spaces with underscores. Um, it gives you less customization than what the previous option gave you, but if you have lots and lots of variables to work with, you may not want to write out the names for each and every one of them. So this would give you something a little bit quicker uh, that you can work with. And now we have variable names with no spaces in them, which means we're able to use them uh, much more easily uh, downstream in our analysis. Next, let's talk about variable types. We've seen an example of what happens when we read data into R and R makes some guesses about the variable types and does some type coercion for us. That was the cat lovers example we looked at earlier and we addressed how we would fix this after the data is read in using some statements like a mutate and a case when. Another thing we might do is actually intervene when the data is being read in. So let's take a look at this data set. I have a CSV file with three columns, X, Y, and Z. And uh, the question I want to answer first is what type is X and Y? When I look at the file itself, it looks like it should be some sort of numeric data, right? I have a bunch of numbers here, the character string NA, but like that's just an NA. And we also have a period here, which is usually uh, used to denote NAs as well. But when we read this into R, we can see that it's being read in as a character string and the reason or a character variable. And the reason is the character string period in here that shows up. And you can imagine if this was a large data set and you kind of just scanned the file to see what things look like, you could have very easily missed that one character string and could be pulling your hair out as to why is this not being read in the way I want it to. Um, there are a couple ways we can address this. Well, there are probably more ways we can address it, but I'm going to talk about two of them. The first one is by explicitly defining your NA. So if you know uh, what sort of character strings are used to denote NAs in your data set, um, you can actually give those as part of the NA argument in the read CSV function. So in the read CSV function, by default, an empty character string or the character string NA is read in as an NA. Uh, but we can add more to it. So here we know that we have a period to denote an NA, so I gave it that. The number 9999, believe it or not, these large numbers in some disciplines are used to denote NAs as well. And also the character string not applicable. So if I give this information to read CSV upon reading in the data, it will actually replace these correctly with NAs. And then we can see that the type of X is now double, which is the default numeric type we would expect anyway. Another option is to specify the column types. And this might be something that is handy when you know what your column types should be, say you have some information like date or, you know, like sales price or something like that. So you know what those column types should be, uh, but you have a large data set and you, you can't uh, scan through to see what other crazy character strings may have snuck in there that should be considered as NAs. We can do this using the call types argument in the read CSV function, where we give it a list of column types. So in this case, we're saying X, the first one is double, Y, the second one is character, and Z, the last one is character as well. And when we do this, um, R is giving me one warning. And the reason for that warning is that on row six, so that's the one where we had that uh, period in column X, so over here, R expected a double because I said this column should be a double, but the actual observation was a period. And so what it did is coerce that into an NA, which is exactly what I wanted it to do, but it's being explicit and telling me, hey, I made this change on your behalf. Make sure that's what you wanted me to do. Um, as I said, this option might be preferable 
if you can't scan through or don't know what convention is being used for NAs in your data set, but you happen to know your column types, um, the downside of this is this something like a character string like 9999 is then not going to be converted into an NA. So you're basically, you can mix and match these or you can choose one or the other and then do some data cleaning afterwards. And there's probably not a one size fits all solution. So this is going to be a decision making process based on the data, how familiar you are with it, how much of the conventions it follows, and also potentially the size of the data set. Uh, the various column types are listed here. These are not things you should feel like you have to memorize. You can always look them up, but it's useful to know that these are the things that you can uh, feed into that call types argument upon reading in your data. And when you look at this table of call character, call date, call double, call factor, if you're thinking, I know we haven't talked about these a lot, but I feel like I've seen it somewhere. That's actually what the read CSV function prints out when you read data in. So when you read the data in, because it's guessing, uh, which is actually one of the options here, call guess, which is the default option, it looks at your data and guesses what uh, type it should be. Um, when it's doing the guessing, it then wants to be explicit and tell you, hey, these are the guesses I've made on your behalf, and it prints this out for you. Then sometimes this printout can be a little bit pesky. Oftentimes in our R Markdown documents, we turn that off with message equals false as a chunk option. But sometimes it can be really handy as well. If you don't agree with its choices, you can simply copy this string um, and then paste that into your call types argument, changing whichever ones you don't agree with to one that you prefer. Um, now let's take a look at a mini case study where we put all of the stuff that we've learned into action. So we're gonna look at a data set of favorite foods. The data set looks something like this. I have five students. I know their student IDs, their names, their favorite food, their meal plan, so whatever meal plan they're on at school, their age, and also their socioeconomic status. And you can again see that the data set is quite messy. The column type, the column names are a little bit all over the place. There seems to be a variety of ways how we've indicated NAs. So we're gonna try to get through all of these. Um, now, some of this might look like made up data, and this particular one actually is, it's a small data set, but it is actually realistic. When you get real data um, out in the wild, it can be as messy as it seems here. Um, let's read the data set in. So this is in an Excel file, so I'm reading it in using read underscore Excel. Um, and here is what the result looks like. I have a table of five rows and six columns, and I can see that the uh, variable names that have spaces in them are actually quoted. So what are some things I might want to do? Probably the first thing I wanna do is fix up the variable names. I like doing that first because then when I'm referring to particular columns for doing additional operations, I can actually refer to them using names that are a little bit easier to work with. I'm going to use the clean names function from the janitor package again, cause they seem like the names are not that all over the place, they're not very long. I'm okay with them automatically being converted into snake case. So now my names have been converted into snake case that I can use uh, more easily in my R functions. Next, I probably wanna deal with my NAs. I don't actually have any empty cells here, but I have an N-A and I have a 99999 as a character string that should have been encoded as NAs. So we're gonna go ahead and explicitly feed them into our uh, read Excel function. Earlier, I gave this example with read CSV, but you can see that the same arguments uh, are in the read Excel function as well. So I'm saying if we have an N-A or this large number, convert them into NAs, and we can see in the output, uh, once we read in the data, that they have now been converted into NAs. What else? We also have some of these ages that are typed in as the words as opposed to the numeric values. So we know that we're going to have to manually intervene and recode them. Now there's probably an R package that would do this for you as well. To be honest, if you had to do this for a bunch of numbers, you probably don't want to write a giant mutate statement for it. 
there's probably an R package that will look at some uh, words that are in English or maybe also in other languages and convert them if they match a numeric number. But here, let's keep things simple. We only we know that we only need to convert a single character string five into the number five. Uh, so the way I'm going to do that is I'm using an if else function. It's only one condition I'm gonna check for, so I don't need a case when, just an if else function where if age is equal to the character string five, make it five, but note that I'm keeping it as a character string still, but typing in the number in there. Um, otherwise, leave it alone and just keep the old value of age. So these if else statements is, the first argument is condition, the second argument is what should we do if the condition is true, and the third argument is what should we do if the condition is false. Now that I've done this and I have now converted this into a character string, uh, the age column into a character string as well, but the l word five have been replaced with the number five, uh, I can then run as numeric on it to explicitly uh, convert my character strings that are numbers in there into numeric values. So once I do this and I, I glimpse at my data set, I can see that now age is stored as a double, which is the default uh, numeric uh, data type in R. Also socioeconomic status, let's take a look. Uh, socioeconomic status is defined as either high, middle or low in this data set. But what order are the levels listed in if I was to do summarization or visualization with them? So let's go ahead and count the SES variable. And so we can see that there are two rows where the SES is high, one uh, observation where it's low, and two where it's middle. So the order in which this uh, summary uh, or this frequency table is given to me is high, low, and middle, which basically is alphabetical. And again, whenever you see an alphabetical ordering, you wanna ask yourself, is that what I want? Maybe sometimes it is. Or is there something a little bit more inherently reasonable that I would like them in? Socioeconomic status is categorical, but also ordinal. So the order of the levels matter. So we probably want to reorder these. And we can do that using, it's a categorical variable in R, so a factor. And I want to manipulate the levels for better display and summarization, which makes me think I should use something from the four cats package. All of the functions in the four cats package start with the prefix FCT for factor. And what I want to do is I want to manually relevel the um, this variable. So the first argument is SES, the name of the variable. And then I give the levels in the order that I want them to appear. Now it's really important that here you type out the levels uh, the same way that they appear in the data set. Um, so capital L, capital M, capital H, and I'm also typing them out in the order that I want. If you wanted to first change up the levels to say something other than low, middle, and high, or use different capitalization, you would want to do that first and then you can reorder things. So now that we have written over the SES variable with a mutate uh, and change the ordering of the levels in it, uh, we can see that the same ends, but shuffled around so that the display is given to us as low, middle, and then high. Now that we've done all of these, and we've done them iteratively, right? We did one thing, we looked at the data and said, ah, there's one other thing we need to address. We, there's one other thing we need to address. And that's really how you should be thinking about this process. Ultimately, the code for cleaning up this mini data set looks something like this. And I could have simply shown you this and talk through all of that as well. But I chose to go through it incrementally because that's exactly the process that I would go through to clean this data set. So you should not anticipate being able to foresee all the possible things that could go wrong with this data set that might need your intervention before you even set out to do your analysis. You should read it in. Take a look at it, see what you don't like, address one thing at a time and do it again and again until you're happy with the result. And finally, once you're happy with the result, you can shove it all into a single pipeline so things look nicely organized. And what I did here is basically done that, read the data set where I also indicate what the NAs are, 
clean the names. So that's for the variable names and do a few mutations, right? So mutate uh, the data set touching a few of the existing variables so that their types are correct. Um, any data fixes are implemented. And if I have um, a factor, as opposed to a character string, where I want to uh, maintain a particular ordering, I can actually do that as well. And then I save that as an object called fav food. So going forward in my analysis, I don't have to worry about the data cleaning I already had to do. I can just keep moving on from here. Um, now let's go ahead and write this file out. Oftentimes, once you clean your data, you might actually want to write it out so that you store that state and then maybe you start with a new uh, R Markdown file where you're going to do your analysis. This is especially true if you're working on a large scale project or multiple people are working on the project where you get some raw data, you clean it up, you save it, uh, and then the analysis happens based off of that uh, clean data set. So let's go ahead and write this data out. Um, I have the data set was stored as fav food. Uh, the, the name of the object was fav food in my R session. And I'm taking that and using the write CSV function, I'm writing it out and I'm writing it out to my data folder to a CSV file called fav food clean, okay? And then I'm going to read it back in just to show you what it looks like. So I'm reading it in from the same place. And just not to overwrite the earlier one, I'm going to call it fav food clean. Let's take a look at this. That fav food clean, and I'm counting the SES um, variable again. The order is gone, right? We're back to the alphabetical order, high, low, and middle. So what happened here? Well, we saved our data as a CSV file, which is just plain text. So that information about that factor, that notion of a factor with inherent levels that we want ordered in a particular way, there is no way to save that information in a plain text file. So how do we get around this? Um, what we can do is we can actually use data types that are native to R, so called RDS files, um, to store this sort of data. So if you have at the stage of doing your data cleaning, if you've created things like factors that are notions that are uh, specific to R and cannot really be um, captured in a plain text file, Instead of writing your data out to a CSV, you should consider writing it out to an RDS file. So CSVs can be unreliable for saving interim results if there's specific variable type information that you want to hold on to. The alternative is RDS files, and you can write, uh, read and write them with read RDS and write RDS respectively. So uh, we can basically say, I am going to write fav food um, into a um, file called favfoodclean.rds. And then I am going to read it back in from that with read RDS. And if I then do the count on my SES variable, I can actually see that that order was maintained. Uh, what about other types of data? Well, there are a variety of other types of data, and this slide seems to have a lot of them on there, and this is not even the whole story. Uh, but let's touch on a few of them that you might come across. Uh, Google Sheets is a, you know, just as commonly used a method probably as Excel for storing data. And there is a package called Google Sheets 4 that will talk to your Google account and sheets that you have in your Google account and directly read data from there. So for example, if you use a Google form to collect some data, you can directly read the data in from there without having to first download your survey results um, in, onto your computer. Another package called Haven is useful for reading data from other software. Um, DBI uh, works along with a specific backend for various databases. So you can actually run SQL queries against the database from R and they'll return a data frame. Uh, JSON files are commonly used and also XML files are commonly used for hierarchical data storage um, and um, mostly web data as well. So you can work with those with these two uh, packages. We are going to do some web scraping in this class, and that's when we're going to talk about Arvest. You can also talk to web um, APIs with uh, HTTR 
or data loaded into Spark with Sparklier. The reason why I'm mentioning all of these names is that while it seems like we've learned a lot, we've really scratched the surface of um, various data types there are out there. Um, so there, but if you ever find yourself needing to work with a different data type, the first question you want to ask yourself is, is there a package for that? And my guess is there is going to be, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. At the same time, even though it seems like we've only looked at just a few options for reading in data, and there's clearly a long list out there, the ones that we have looked at in detail are probably the most commonly used data types. So yes, you've learned a small subset of the number of packages out there, but from a utility perspective, you've learned a lot. Um, at this point, I'd recommend that you, you know, end the video here and uh, draw, uh, kind of divert your attention to the uh, next application exercise, which is the Nobels and Sales and Data Import one again. And this time, I want you to take a look at the Sales-Excel R Markdown file. In this file, you're asked to load in an Excel file, which is like a little bit oddly formatted and has some like header rows, like titles and whatnot in it that are outside of your data frame, which is super frustrating when all you're trying to do is to read the data frame in, but very common as well that you'll see out in the wild. So we want you to load that in uh, from the data raw file folder and use appropriate arguments for the read excel function such that it looks like the output that's on the left so over here um you are going to need to deal with nas and we've already talked about that but a hint for you is that you're also going to need to deal with what happens with the top few rows in that excel file um where there's some like meta information about the data but nothing that is part of the data frame how can i go about skipping that so read the uh docs for the read excel function to find out what more you can do to take control of the data as you're reading it in a stretch goal then is with the data that you have read in once it looks like the one on the left if you want to push yourself folder further manipulate this data such that it actually looks like the output on the right i'll give you these two outputs as part of your um application exercise as well so you can actually focus on your work uh, within our studio cloud and don't have to come back to take a look at the images here